Hey guys, so I hope everyone's doing well. Um, the iPad looks super blurry, um, but okay, we're gonna just kind of keep it like that. It looks a little blurry to me, but for the most part, as long as you can hear me, this is how we're gonna have to go with it, guys. If you check the um, last video and the video before that, you'll understand what's going on with this video. Um, I will put announcements and different things like that up underneath the description box of this video and the next video. I'm sorry if I look dark or blurry. It is the lightning um, in the room. I only have two bulbs instead of three because I kind of don't like too much light like that. Um, it depends on where it is. But uh, we're going to get into Judges. We're going to start with Judges 9 because if you guys remember last week, I kind of like lost my voice and it was way worse. It's getting better. You know, it can still get better, but it is getting a lot better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split up um, between Judges 9 to 21 within this video and the next video. And we'll close out the book of Judges between those two videos. And if I have any videos, any other videos besides Bible study this week, I will come on. Um, and let you guys know I have a few ideas in mind but I'll just keep those in mind and just let the week go on and then I'll release it um, once it's time so I'm going to give you a sec to get your Bibles your notebooks or whatever you want to use if you want to take notes only because we're reading a lot more um, in these two videos than we normally do so I'll give you a second to get your Bible and whatever you want to write with and go to Judges chapter 9 with me I'm thinking that in this video we're going to read Judges um, 9 through 15 and we'll study it and you guys can tell me what you think and different things like that and then we'll do um, 16 through 21 in the second video up after this okay and you guys let me know your thoughts let me know um, what you got out of it what you're getting out of it I'll put which day it is for each <coughs> and don't mind my coughing because it's been helping as well so so I'm gonna give you guys a quick overview I'm not gonna go over the outline um because we already went over the outline in day one which we did last week but I'm gonna give you guys an overview of what we'll be reading about okay just so you understand so judges 9 we're gonna be talking about Abimelech judges 10 we're gonna be talking about Tola JR and Jephthah Judges 11 is going to be talking about some different things. Um, Judges 12, we're going to be talking about Jephthah and Ephraim. Judges 13, we're going to be talking about the birth of Samson. And if you guys remember, we did a, I don't want to say a video on Samson, but we, we kind of read this chapter and a few chapters regarding Samson, but it was with another video. Because uh, there were some other stories and notes that we talked about with that as well. Um, Judges 14, we're talking about Samson's marriage. And then we're going to end with 15 for this video, which is Samson's vengeance on the Philistines. So we have a lot more to cover um, this week. So let's start with, um, thank you, Lord, for this Bible study time. May it be a blessing, Father God, to everybody that's listening. Father God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Judges 9, and guys, um, I'm not sure if I can flip this so you guys can see it, but just read along with me in your Bible. I'm reading from the NIV. I'm open to all translations. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm reading from the NIV, but you guys can come from, you know, whatever is good for you, okay? So Judges chapter 9, Abimelech. Abimelech, son of Jerubel, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them, and to all his mother's clan and guys forgive my voice you guys understand what's going on my voice is getting better i'm going to drink more tea today and it's a lot stronger than it was some days ago and it's getting better and better so i think i'm thanking god for that so ask all the citizens of shechem which is better for you to have all 70 of jerubbaal's jerubbaal's sons rule over you or just one man remember i am your flesh and blood when the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Bimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And I'm kind of blown because the other day when we were reading Judges 8, I didn't know before we read this that um, Gideon had 70 children. I didn't know that. When we, when we read it together, I found out, but I was like, wow, that's a lot of kids. I know the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. 
you know, but that's a lot of kids, you know, so we're seeing what's going on with his son, you know, and he went to his mother's brothers, so these are his, his um, these are Gideon's sons as well, because remember he was called Jerubel, remember when we read it about a couple chapters before, so let's keep reading, so let's get into verse 3, when the, when the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, somebody say Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. They gave him 70 shekels of silver, and in the footnotes, that's about one-third, fourth pounds, or 0 0.8 kilograms of silver, from the temple of baal Bareth, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless adventurers who became his followers. <coughs> Excuse me. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers. Oh my God, he killed his brothers, y'all. I never read this part before. Go to verse 5. You reading this along with me. He went to his father's home in Ophra, and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers. I am blown. We just learned that this man had 70 sons, and he went and murdered them. So, the sons of Jerubel, but Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubel, escaped by hiding. I'm just wondering what's up with Abimelech, because you're going to them, you're talking to them, it seems seeming like everything is fine, and then with one stone, you kill all of them, you know, except the youngest one who escaped. So, that's, that's this is a lot going on. Okay, so let's go to verse 6. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. I'm just really wondering for real, what would possess him to do this? Because... It seems like his brothers weren't against him to me. So I was like, why would you do that? Is it an unclean spirit? Is it pride? Like, what is I feel like the more we read, we'll uncover more. But it's just like, I think it's wrong of him to do that. <coughs> okay, let's keep reading. So now Abimelech is crowned king. When Jotham was told about this, this is his youngest brother, right? He climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, and I'm reminded of what we read about in Genesis that there's always a ram in the bush. Because look, this was kind of like a ram in the bush. They didn't think he would be there, but he was. Even though Abraham did say the, the Lord will provide. So that's a totally different context. So I don't want to take that out of context. But that, I was just kind of reminded of that just personally. So anyway, verse 7. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them listen to me citizens of shechem so that god may listen to you somebody repeat that so i'm sorry verse eight one day the trees went out to anoint the king for themselves they said to the olive tree be our king i'm already seeing that this is a parable right kings trees going out okay so but the olive tree answered should i give up my oil by which both gods and men are honored to hold sway over the trees. Next, the tree said to the fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? We're getting into verse 12, guys. Then the tree said to the vine, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and men to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. And it doesn't, you know, there's a, there's a message in this, what he's saying, but a thorn bush, because like he's, the, he, this parable is to the olive tree, the fig tree, the vine, and now the thorn bush. And if you read about, and you study, you Google the thorn bush, or even just read about different places in the Bible, like I said, but before another place that talk, mentioned the thorn bush or reference it, it produces it doesn't produce things that these other trees and these other things that we read about do, right? <clears throat> so, but I, I know there's a message in this, though, with this parable that he sent to these people. So, let's get into um, 15. The thorn bush said to the trees, If you really want to anoint me king over you, 
come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Someone say Lebanon. Now, if you have acted honorably and in good faith when you made Abimelech king, and if you have been fair to Jerubel and his family, and if you have treated him as he deserves, and to think that my father fought for you, risk is that's what I was just thinking about. You know, when we read back on Gideon, it's like he did a lot, you know, and to think that my father fought for you, risk his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today you have revolted against my father's family, murdered his 70 sons on a single stone, and made Abimelech the son of his slave girl, king over the citizens of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you acted honorably and in good faith toward Jerubel and his family today, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. So let's get into verse 21. <coughs> okay. Then Jotham fled, escaping to Beer. And he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. But you know what this is displaying to me? Even his dad, you know, we read about a couple of chapters ago, had some challenges where he had to be brave and bold and courageous. And it really took the hand of God to get him from one level, not just physically, but mentally as well, to the next. And, you know, his son also had that boldness and that courageous, or he found it because even though he went back into escaping and living there because he was afraid of his brother at least he had the courage to say what he said right and sometimes that's what it takes it takes courage for you to do what god needs you to do it takes courage for you to be bold and be brave it takes courage for you to um step outside of your comfort zone and out of the box and really trust god and move into what god has it takes courage sometimes to speak up it takes courage sometimes to say yes to yourself and others. And God takes courage sometimes to say no. It takes courage sometimes to be silent. It takes courage sometimes, you know, to um, flow with Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, right? So let's get into verse 22. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, might have say three years, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem who acted treacherously against Abimelech. See, he reaped what he sowed. And Galatians 6 talks about that, as well as Luke 6, 38. And then remember, too, I'm not sure if you guys remember our David series, but remember what Saul, when that, that evil spirit was sent, that, that tormenting spirit was sent to him, right? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm kind of reminded of that. So let's go to 24. God did this in order that the crime against Jerubel's 70 sons the shedding of their blood might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem, who helped him murder his brothers. And then remember back in January when we did our Genesis series, what did God say with Cain and Abel? He said, Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You know, so some people feel like, oh, if I cover it up or if I do it this way, it'll never be revealed or this, that, the third. But God is watching and God knows when to act and when to release and react. He knows when to do it because he's God. And just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean that he's not going to do it. Doesn't mean that he's not God enough to do it. It could be varying things going on. It could be that it's not the fullness of time. It could be maybe he wants um, that person to repent, to give him grace and mercy. Or it could just be it's not the fullness of time for his, his once, the, once the time comes like a bump on your face and it gets to a head and then it bursts that's it it's over you know and it could be that like ecclesiastes 3 1 talks about there's a time season for everything so it could also be like um it's time it's a set time for his vengeance because the bible does say that vengeance is mine says the lord i will repay okay so so let's go to 25 reading down so in opposition to him the citizens of shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by and this was reported to Abimelech now Gaal or Gaal the name is G-A-A-L son of Ebed moved with his brothers into Shechem excuse me and his citizens put their confidence in him 
after they had gone in Judges 9 is, a, is very lengthy guys <coughs> excuse me I didn't know it was this lengthy but it's pretty lengthy so we're just going to keep reading and, and bear along so 27 so after they had gone out into the fields and gathered the grapes and trodden them they held the festival in the temple of their God while they were eating and drinking they cursed Abimelech then Gael said I'm sorry then Gael son of Ethan said who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should be subject to him? Isn't he Jerubel's son? And isn't Zubel his deputy? Serve the men of Hamor, Shechem's father. Why should we serve Abimelech? If only this people were under my command, then I would get rid of him. I would say to Abimelech, call out your whole army. 30. When Zubel, the governor of the city, heard what Gael, son of Ebed, said, he was very angry. Undercover, he sent messengers to Abimelech, saying, Gael, son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem and are stirring up the city against you. Now then, during the night, you and your men should come and lie in wait in the fields. In the morning at sunrise, advance against the city. When Gael and his men come out against you, do whatever your hand finds to do. How do you guys feel about that? Now it's like the tables have turned, right? So 34, so Abimelech and all his troops set out by night and took up concealed positions, somebody say concealed positions, near Shechem in four companies. Now Gael son of Ebed had gone out and was standing at the entrance to the city gate just as Abimelech and his soldiers came out from their hiding place. When Gael saw them, he said to Zubel, look down, I'm sorry, look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul replied, You mistake the shadows of the mountains for men. But Gael spoke up again. Look, people are coming down from the center of the land, and a company is coming from the direction of the soothsayer's tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where is your big talk now? You who said, Who is the Bimelech that we should be subject to him? Aren't these the men you ridicule? Go out and fight them. So Gael led out the citizens of Shechem and fought Abimelech. Abimelech chased him and many fell wounded in the flight all the way to the entrance to the gate. Abimelech stayed in Aruma and Zebul drove Gael and his brothers out of Shechem. Guys, the names that we're doing good today, I'm going to keep reading in the midst of these names. So the next day, the people of Shechem went out to the fields and this was reported to Abimelech. So he took his men, divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields when he saw the people coming out of the city he rose to attack them abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance to the city gate <coughs> okay, excuse me so then two companies rushed down rushed upon those in the fields and struck them down all that day abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he had captured it and killed his people then he destroyed the city and scattered side over. And don't worry, I'm going to use hand sanitizer once I get up after I'm done with this recording. Because I've been using that. So, and i also been spraying the room as well. You know, spraying it to eliminate the odors and stuff. So on hearing this, the citizens in the Tower of Shechem went into the stronghold of the Temple of el Baruch. When the Bimelech heard that they had assembled there, he and all his men went up to Mount Zalmon. He took an axe and cut off some branches, which he lifted to his shoulders. He ordered the man with him, quick, do what you have seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them. I see why this chapter is named after him. Right? So let's get into 49. So they piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire over the people inside. So all the people in the tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women also died. Wow. So next, Abimelech went to Thebes and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all the men and women, all the people of the city fled. And Psalms 91 talks about the Lord being our strong tower, right? <coughs> Psalms also talks about the strong tower of God, right? Other Psalms. So, they locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Abimelech went to the tower and stormed it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, 
a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull now <coughs> excuse me i don't know if you guys remember when we read judges chapter four but this is kind of reminding me of um of that of jail right it's reminding me of jail And what a crazy way to die. But it's like, I'm just reminded. You know when Jesus said, um, those who live by the sword, die by the sword, with, when they came to arrest him when it was his time. And um, they were in the garden. And the people came and Judas betrayed him. And Peter took that sword and, you know, the person's ear. And then, like, even in the movies, like, and this is, I'm just reminded of that because it's like he did all that evil to his brothers and to other people and look how it happened for him you know a mill uh, you google and look up what a millstone is the woman was a woman dropped the upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull so let's close for 54 to 57 and we'll get into judges chapter 10 hurriedly he called to his armor bearer draw your sword and kill me so that they can't say a woman killed me and that's what Saul said too um, in battle when Jonathan killed himself you know he told his servant to kill him but I don't think his servant had the courage to do it and I think he ended up killing himself if I'm not mistaken so his servant ran him through and he died when the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead they went home it don't even say they mourn for him because Proverbs, we get a Proverbs series, but Proverbs talks about, you know, when a wicked person is in power or they die, it's like the righteous rejoice pretty much. <coughs> These people went home. It didn't say they felt sorry that he died or even nothing. Say they went home. Thus, God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. And then I also wanted to take into account because I don't have any notes. We're just reading, studying together. Um, I want us to also take into account. I'm seeing this as well. Like Those men carried legacy. They carried destiny. They carried within them the ability to, to birth and reproduce. Or to connect you know, with the women and carry on legacy and have family. And they had dreams and goals. And God had a mission and purpose for them as well. You know... And what a blessing, excuse me, for Gideon to have had all those kids. And then for, you know, his son to just do that. Guys, bear with me a moment. This is going dead. Let me get the charger because I don't want it to cut off on you guys, okay? Just bear with me a second. Okay, I got the charger. Give me a sec. And it is charging. Okay, cool. Just hold on one sec. <coughs> so, okay, guys, it's on the charger. So, let's keep going. So, Okay, so 57. God also made the men of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jerubal, came on them. <coughs> the one we read about, right? So, okay, cool. So, we're going to get into Judges 10 now. And it looks like Judges 10 is pretty short. 11 is a little lengthy. 12 is kind of short. Yeah, these are kind of be a little short, shorter. Okay, so chapter 10. And what do you guys think about Judges chapter 9? What do you guys think about our Judges series? What did you get out of chapter 9? Like, which character did you relate to the most? What did you think about all of it? Leave it in the comments or something. So, Judges 10. So, after the time of Abimelech, a man of Issachar, Tola, son of Pua, the son of Dodo, rose to save Israel. And I'm not being disrespectful. So he lived in Shamir in the hill.
country of Ephraim. He led Israel 23 years, then he died and was buried in Shamir. Okay, so that's Tolum. Not much about him, <coughs> but he is referenced in here, right? So now we're going to talk about Jair. He was followed by Jair of Gilead, who led Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, and 30 is such a symbolic number, which to this day are called Havoth Jair, or, you know, in the footnotes it says, or called the settlements of Jair. When Jair died, he was buried in Canaan. And then we're going to talk about Jephthah. We're going to um, chapter 11. But let's read verses 6 through 18 to close out 10. So again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And if you go back, as we've been reading Judges and even the outline of different things we've been talking about, there's a pattern and a cycle in place here with them doing this, right? So they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them, right? We've given you so many um, references regarding these different types of things. We've done a lot of videos on them, giving you guys lots of scriptures, talked about the different, some of the different things they used to do, all of those things, right? So let's keep reading. So he became angry with them, seven going into eight reading down he sold them into the hands of the philistines and the ammonites who that year shattered and crushed them somebody say shattered and crushed for 18 years they oppressed all the israelites on the east side of the jordan and gilead the land of the amorites the ammonites also crossed the jordan to fight against judah benjamin and the house of ephraim and israel was in great distress then the israelites cried out to the lord they have sinned against you, forsaken our God, and serving the Baals. The Lord replied, When the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites, and it says, Hebrew, some step to again, manuscript says Midianites, or the Maonites, right? Oppressed you, and you cried to me for help. Did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. And you would feel like that. I would feel like that. We're human and someone just keeps constantly being in that cycle with us. We would feel like that. If we're always coming to the rescue. And it's like, how do you think God feels? But we've all been there where we've had our idolatry and sinned against God. But it's like to keep on doing it. Reading about him continuously doing it. Consciously doing it. It's like, excuse me, you know, that's very hurtful. So, um, but the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And he could bear Israel's misery no, long, no longer because he loves them, just like he loves you, right? So when the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead <coughs> excuse me, said to each other, Whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of all those living in Gilead. So let's see who's going to launch this attack. Let's get into Judges 11. We're still kind of talking about Jephthah. We'll be talking about him in 12 as well. Right? So Judges 11. Jephthah the Gileadite, the Gile, the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. I remember we um, did this. I don't know if you guys remember. Early last year, like February sometime, I think. February last year, we did a 66-day Bible study challenge. Um, and it was so out of my comfort zone. Um, yeah. But we did a 6 day Bible study challenge, and we went through each book in the Bible. And we did like a mini sermon on each, or we did a, well, we read a scripture or a passage on each, and we kind of talked about it, how God was leading for that day. And we did it for 66 days straight. And um, we kind of came from this with Jephthah, with Judges 11. I forgot what it's called, but you can go back on there on that playlist and check it out. And um, I think I have things 
yeah just check it out so it's on one of those so okay so gilead's wife <coughs> also bore him sons and when they were grown up they drove jephthah away you are not going to get any inheritance in our family they said because you are the son of another woman so jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him Sometime later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander, so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, and we also did um, read about this in one of our more recent videos as well. Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? Right? So he's leaving what's established now to go back. Is that something that you guys think you would have done? If it were you, you know, like if the shoe were on the other foot. So let's get into 10 and keep reading down. The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. <coughs> Excuse me for the coughing, guys. And the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Somebody say Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question. We just gonna call him Jeff, okay? Because the names. We just gonna call him Jeff for short as we continue to read, okay? Okay, so what do you have against us that you have attacked our country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jeff's messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jeff sent back messengers to the Ammonite king saying, This is what Jeff says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammon Ammonites. But when they came up out of Egypt, remember we read about that, right? Israel went through the desert to the Red Sea, or it says Yom Sup in Hebrew, that is Sea of Reeds in the footnotes, and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, Give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They also sent the king, they also, they sent also, sorry, to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next, they traveled through the desert, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, did not trust Israel, or in the footnotes, however, would not make an agreement for Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his men in the camp at Jahaz and fought with Israel. 21 of Judges 11. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his men into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God, Shemush, gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess it. Someone need to claim that. Judges 11, 24. Okay, 25. Are you better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Aroer, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Has anyone ever gone through that? So let's keep reading. So let the Lord, the judge, or the ruler in the footnotes, 
decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. <coughs> the king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jeff sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jeff. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. One sec, guys. And Jeff made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. That's a very powerful vow to make. We've talked about it before. But that's a powerful vow to make. So then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Ar Aror to the vicinity of Meneth as far as Abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jeb returned to his home in Mitzvah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Dancing to the sound of tamarind, she was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. And the Bible has that there for us for emphasis because remember the vow that he just made a couple verses before, right? So when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable and rich because I... I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. I'm not sure why I'm yawning, but I don't want really to really say I need rest, but I did kind of get some rest and I'm okay. I mean, I will go to bed early tonight. I'm not really sleepy, but it could just be you know, you're constantly reading, just reading, and you, I don't know if you guys have experienced that. Okay, so let's go to um, 37. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go. And not only, I'm just thinking, thank you, Holy Spirit. Not only will she not marry, she's not going to have kids. She's not going to be able to fulfill her goals and purpose. And I know... Like God knows, like all of our days are numbered in his book. Like Psalms 139 talks about, but it's like, it's just so weird because the way that she died, you know? And that's like um, Abraham and Isaac. Well, he could have been like a sacrifice. But there was a ram in the bush. And God was just testing him. But with this, this girl literally has to die as a burnt offering. Alive. Wow. So, 38, you may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. And imagine the pain and the grief that's going in her mind and through her heart and through his mind and heart. You know, this is a very sensitive yet traumatic situation. So, she and the girls went into the hills and what because she would never marry. And then they're losing a friend, too. You know? So, after the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite custom that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jeph, the Gilead. So now we're going to talk about Jephthah and Ephraim. And this is Judges 12. We have two more chapters to read after this. And then we'll get into the next video. <coughs> and then that'll be it for, for now. So... The men of Ephraim called out their forces. Cross over. Did you go with me to Judges 12? Cross over to Zephon and said to Jeph, Why did you go to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. So we're in verse 2. Jeph answered, I and my people were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites. And although I called you, you didn't save me out of their hands. Who can relate? Three, when I saw that you wouldn't help, I took my life in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites. And the Lord <coughs> gave me the victory over them. Now, why have you come up today to fight me? Give me a minute. 
I'm reaching for my water bottle. I have one up here and one down here. I thought the other one's over here, but I'm fine, guys. I have the AC and the fan on at the same time. Usually, I just have one or the other on, but I'm going to turn this one off before the second video, so don't worry. So, let's get into verse 4. Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, You Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the forts of the Jordan, leading to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked, Are you an Ephraimite? If he replied, No, they said, All right, say Shibboleth. <laughs> what is shibboleth and what does shibboleth mean listen to this if he said shibboleth because he could not pronounce the word correctly they seized him and killed him at the forts of the Jordan 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time Jeb led Israel six years then Jeb the Gileadite died and was buried in the town in Gilead so let's close out 12 and then we'll get into 13 if Zon, Ellen, and Abdon, and some of these that we kind of talked about or, you know, read before or did some videos on before, I really didn't want to reread, like I didn't want to reread about um, Jephthah or um, Samson because we read about Samson, but there may be some people that are new watching, uh, maybe you didn't catch those other videos or Bible studies series, so I just want to read all of it in its entirety, so you know, we followed along and you guys got the complete Bible study. The only one I don't think I read was um, the two about um, Deborah and Deborah's song because we just recently did those like last week. So that's more recent. Okay, so again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I'm sorry, just skip the verse 13. Let's go back to verse 8 of Judges 12. Bear with me. So after him is Ibzan of Bethlehem led Israel. He had 30 sons and 30, 30 daughters. Excuse me. He gave his daughters away in marriage to those outside his clan. And for his sons, he brought in 30 young women as wives from outside his clan. Ibzan led Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried in Bethlehem. <coughs> After him, Elon, the zoo, oh Jesus, the Zeb, the Zebulonite led Israel ten years. Then Elon died and was buried in Agilon in the land of Zebulon. After him, Abdon, son of Hillel Hil from Pirathon, led Israel. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons. So these people are really having a lot of kids, you see, who rode on seven seventy donkeys, like seven zero donkeys. He led Israel eight years. Then Abdon, son of Hilel died and was buried at Pirathon in Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. So now we're going to get into the birth of Samson. And then 13, 14, and 15 is going to be talking about Samson. And then when we do 16 through 21, our table will be talking about on um, that video. Okay, so again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah. One second, guys. I kind of want to lay down while I read this. Just get a little bit more comfortable. If you guys don't mind. I kind of want to just like rest my neck a little bit. You guys can get comfortable too. Some of you may be at work. Because it's Monday if you're listening to this. It's Monday morning. Some of you may be um, on the road running errands. Some of you may be at the gym. Some of you may be in your room. Some of you may be on break. Whatever your case is. Um. I'm going to get comfortable real quick, okay? Because if you're watching this video, I'm probably at the library right now doing homework. Just finished the prayer line. Because the library opens at 9. The prayer line is at 9. And I'm going to release these videos after the line. So if you're watching this, I've already got my day started. Well, usually I get up like 6, 5, 6, get my day started. But I'm going to lay down for now, okay? So, <coughs> okay, so... Let's go into verse 2. So a certain man of Zorah named Manoah, somebody say Manoah, from the clan of the dead knights had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless. 
childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now, I don't know if you guys remember when we did Luke. In Luke 1, <coughs> we read about, um, try to fix it a little bit. You guys just heard me. We read about Zechariah and um, Elizabeth, right? But the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah. I'm going to try to fix this just a little bit, guys, so you guys can still kind of see. But in this case, he's going to, you know, to her, right? Okay, so let's keep reading. As long as you guys can hear me, I'm okay. So let's go to verse 4. <coughs> now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. Because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Somebody said Nazarite. Set apart to God from birth. And he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So God had his hand set on him from before he was set apart from, you know, before, right? So then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from his birth until the day of his death. Now as we're continuing to read about um, Samson, I want you guys to pay attention. I want to see if I can turn it. Yeah, so it's going to go sideways. Okay, so that's going to be a little bit better for me right now with the reading. Okay, so it's going to go a little sideways, but just bear with me. We have two more chapters after this. But I want you guys to take into consideration and remember this part that we just read. Remember these first, um, like, verses of um, Judges 13, okay? So let's get into verse 8. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord. O oh Lord, I beg you, let the men of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. And another thing that I love about this is that he trusted his wife. He didn't question her too much. He didn't um, doubt her. He didn't cast it off. He, he actually believed her, and he put his faith in action with that, right? So, verse 9, God heard Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband, Manoah, was not with her. <coughs> the woman hurried to tell her husband, he, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. And for people that feel like God don't answer prayer, God has different ways that he answers prayer. There's some prayers that he's going to answer and some he's not. There are some you're going to thank God that he did answer. Some you're going to be grateful to God that he didn't. And then there are some things that God is going to do that we don't understand. But I love the way that God showed himself strong, you know, and, and answered this prayer request for them and had this manifestation happen for them. Like this encounter you know i think that's so wonderful so let's go to verse 12 so manoah asked him when when your words are fulfilled what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work <coughs> the angel of the lord answered your wife must do all that i have told her she must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine nor drink any wine or other fermented drink nor eat anything unclean she must do everything i have commanded her Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stand until we prepare a young goat for you. Right? That's like hospitality and kindness as well. So the angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? And then also remember, um... Like back in Genesis when we were reading with Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't come looking like angels. <coughs> they came looking like men. 
but they were angels. So let's go to verse 18. He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. And then in the footnote says, or it is wonderful. Then Manoah took a young goat together with a grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Now, if you were Manoah and, and his wife, how would you feel if you are experiencing all of this? You're sterile. You're being told you're going to have a child. You're being told the purpose and destiny of this child. You're being to, you're sh you're being shown all this. You pray and God answers your prayer request, and then this angel goes up in this flame. How just how would you feel? Oh, and don't forget, you don't even know that it's an angel. So seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die. And if you go through scripture, so many of them see it because back in those days and times, it's like to experience um, that type of encounter from heaven and from the Lord it was a blessing because it was rare. Even though God did speak through his prophets and different people, it was different back then from like how it is now, the Holy Spirit and different things like that. Even though the Lord did allow some people back then to experience the Holy Spirit or he walked a little bit deeper and closer with them than some of the others um that's a different kind of video so i don't want to go off in a tangent with that but it was like a blessing and a privilege to see it um even like isaiah you know when the angel had to take the coals and put over his mouth or put over him <coughs> because you know he said woe is me you know i'm a man of unclean lips and i come from you know people from were unclean lips so it was like an honor <clears throat> all this coughing guys so so 22 we are doomed to die he said to his wife we have seen God but his wife answered if the Lord had meant to kill us he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands nor shown us all these things or now told us this see that's that wisdom right 24 the woman gave birth to a boy and that's what's coming to me Proverbs he that finds a wife obtains favor from the Lord, finds favor from the Lord, right? That he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, right? So the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Okay. So let's go to Judges 14. Samson's marriage. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an, seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. Excuse me, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, Suddenly, a young lion came roaring toward him. Excuse me. That's what it is. All the reading nonstop. Like, when you don't breathe, like, breathe, breathe between the oxygen in your brain. That's what's... Okay, so let's keep reading. But I'm okay. Let's keep going on. So, five. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn the young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the women, and he liked her. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. In it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. 
When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given thirty companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me thirty linen garments and thirty sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. Pay attention to this. Verse 15, reading down. On the fourth day, and then it says in the footnotes, or seventh day, they said to Simpson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you in your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? Right? Showed you what kind of people you're dealing with. So then Simpson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing. You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. And this is like, so even though this was his wife, it's like she was doing what the people wanted her to do. Because how he don't love you and he's marrying you. How he don't love you and he's here. But you're saying, you don't love me. If you love me, you do this, you do that. It's kind of like a form of manipulation. And then Delilah did that with him too. Even though she didn't love him, it really was just about the money. But to me in this case, and I've never really seen it like this, but to me in this case, his wife wanted the riddle or the person he's supposed to be with wanted the riddle. And then Delilah's going to want that money. See, so it's like, it's like what's going on with Samson and what's going on in Samson. And some of us can relate, right? So she said, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother. He replied, he like, what is up with you? He didn't say this, but I was just, so why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. Who's pressing you today? Who's pressing you? She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. He went down to Ascalon, struck down thirty of their men, stripped them of their belongings, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning, oh my, burning with anger, he went up to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to the friend who had attended him at his wedding. <coughs> Homeboy. Got her. Let's close with Judges 15, guys. Later on at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you thoroughly hated her, he said, that I gave her to your friend. But why would he feel like he hated her? What would possess him to think that he hated her? Or is he just not owning up to something? Watch this Laban spirit. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes. We've talked about this before, how very crazy this was and what a temper or passion or whatever he had going on to do this he went out and caught 300 foxes 300 foxes 300 foxes think about it and tied them tail to tail in pairs he then fastened a torch torch has lightning on it to every pair of tails lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. So that represents business. That represents their livelihood. They needed those olives. They needed that grain to feed their family. You know, that's... So all of that is kind of pretty much ruined. So let's get into verse 6 reading down. 
When the Philistines asked who did this, they were told, Samson the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. I was going to say something about Proverbs, talking about something similar to this, but I'm going to keep reading. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in the cave in the rock of Etown. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? You have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. Then three thousand men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. One sec, guys, and we're closing soon. Give me like 30 more seconds. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flecks, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Simpson said, But the donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. But the donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. But notice he's not giving no glory to God, whose spirit came on him in order that he could do that. So let's close with 17 through 20, and then you guys could check out the next video after this so that we can um, read and close out Judges 16 through 21. So when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramah Lehi, and that means jawbone hill. So because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Okay, he's glorifying God with this. Must I not die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called in Hakor, which means caller spring, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines, or in the Bible it says, or he judged. And you guys, I hope that you enjoy this Judges 9 through 13. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section and what you got out of it. See you guys in the next video.